A lot of people believe that the Russian Mafia started after the Soviet Union collapsed. But that's not right. And that's because the Russian Mafia was before the Communist Revolution. Basically, before 1917. The Russian Mafia's idea was to gather different types of criminals in one group. They call themselves Vori, which means thief in law, and they basically mean they perform organized crime. The labor camps in the 1930s of Soviet Union is where the Russian Mafia actually started to grow. A member of the Mafia was called Vor, and like we said, the group is called Vori. These mafias started in very tough time, and that's in labor camps in the Soviet Union. At that time, it's when the mafia is growing, and whoever wants to join has to show that they're loyal to the mafia. Whoever joined had to put their real name away, and they will be called the name that the boss chose. Whenever a boss changed someone's name, each member had to call them by that name. This idea came from the Orthodox Church of Russia. In an Orthodox Church, whenever a priest is hired, they choose a different name for him, and everybody has to call him that. When you joined the Mafia, not only did they change your name, but you had to tattoo this star somewhere on your body. And that shows that you're part of the Vori. During the Soviet Union, the Mafia was mainly inside the labor camps. But when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Mafia came outside. If you want to look at the history of the Vori, we have to say that in the year 1912, in one of Moscow's prison, this mafia was formed. This was before the collapse of the Russian Empire. After the empire collapsed and the communists won, the government became very strict towards mafias. They were all arrested and sent to prison or labor camp. And that was not because to keep the community safe. And that was because no person or group should have high power in a communist government. It's good to know that the Soviet government is the bloodiest government of all time. Rudolf Rommel is a political scientist and his research shows that the Soviet Union from the year 1917 all the way to 1987, they killed more people than any other government. Professor Rommel says that this government killed around 61,911,000 people. And I'll put the sources in the description. All these people killed was all genocide. I don't think they added all the soldiers that died in World War II to it. And it's good to know that the Soviet Union had the most deaths in World War II. Stats show that the Soviet Union had more than 11 million soldiers killed. And they were mostly young men that didn't know what they were doing. They would just give whatever anybody a gun and tell them to go to the battlefield. And that is why they were killed very easily. But let's get back to the Mafia. But let's get back to World War II with the Mafia. In the year 1940, the Soviet government said Whichever prisoner goes to war, they're free. And you know, a lot of prisoners were very happy about that choice. In the five years of war, one million prisoners went to war. If a mafia member went to war, their boss would label them as a traitor. And they would say, we don't work for the government. And if you go to war, you're working with this government. In the year 1950, 
the government of Soviet Union announced that after this, there's no more mafias in the Soviet Union. In the year 1953, when Stalin dies, the government kind of takes it easy a little bit. And that is why the mafia actually started to form outside of the prison. In a place like the Soviet Union, raising a mafia outside of prison is a lot of work. Either way, the mafia starts to grow year by year. They say the growth was so slow that only 10 people a year would join. The more we move forward, the growing of the mafia becomes a little easier. And when we get to the Gorbachev era, the mafias have gone so big that there's actually a war between them. In the year 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, and we also made a video about it, Russia kind of turned into a heaven for mafias, because the government didn't know what to do, and they easily grew in size. And that's when we get to 1993, where there's 3,000 different mafia groups in Russia. The insane amount of mafia shows that whoever wakes up early in the morning claims that this is their territory. That is why there was a lot of wars going on at that time. The deaths between the 80s and 90s of Russia multiplied by four times. Putin came in power on May of 2000 and he tried to kind of make the country a little better because it was kind of turning into a war zone. And that is why the dictatorship kind of came back. Everything became strict and the mafia's job got more difficult. Putin passed the law that whoever does mafia work or is affiliated with the mafia gets 15 years in prison at least. And they say, from then to now, the members of the Mafia went from 30,000 to 6,000. By doing this, Putin got rid of all the small whatever Mafias. But the powerful ones got even more powerful, and nobody bugs them anymore. But what Putin did is stop the wars in the streets and took them somewhere else. So Putin didn't really get rid of the Russian Mafia, but it just kind of made him into two divisions. Got rid of the weak ones, but the powerful ones got more and more powerful. There's a lot of things to be said about this. Some people say that Putin is part of the Mafia. That is why he's in power for so long. But but these are theories, and nobody knows what's going on. Japan, a country that gave us Toyota, Sony, Drifting, Sushi, and a lot of other weird stuff. If you've seen our video about how to enter the Italian Mafia, you've got to know the Mafia. But the Japanese Mafia is something else. In Japan, they call the Mafia Yakuza. Yakuza basically means Mafia in Japanese, and it's not one specific group. The police call the Yakuza in Japan Boyokuda, which means violent group. The History Channel says there's around 3,000 Yakuza groups in Japan, and all these groups have about 80,000 members in them. The History Channel continues and says the history of Yakuza in Japan started around the 17th century. In modern days, they call themselves something that a lot of people deny. 
They say we are the same as a samurai and instead of the clothes, we're wearing a suit and instead of the sword, we have a gun. We're basically a modern samurai. But a lot of people say a samurai has nothing to do with these guys. They were there to serve the emperor and follow orders and not to start prostitution, dealing drug, stealing, kidnapping, or to help themselves kill other people. But let's continue. Let's look at the four main Yakuza's in Japan. And these are groups that a lot of people are familiar with. The biggest Yakuza group in Japan is Yamaguchi Gumi. The second one is Somi Yoshikai. The third one, Inagawa Kai. And the fourth one and the oldest Yakuza group in Japan, Eizu Kotetsu Kai. Not only are these guys well known in Japan, but they're very well known around the world. Their fame is the same as the Italian mafias in New York. The Yakuza's division is the same as the Italian mafia. There is a mob boss which is called the Oyabun. There's three lieutenants and the other ones are small and big brothers which are basically officers. The biggest Yakuza group in Japan which is the Yamaguchi Gumi is the richest crime family in the world. They believe that this crime family in Japan has around 80 billion dollars. But this money is from drugs, pornography, stock, construction, gambling, and arms dealing. Most of the pornography filmed in Japan belongs to these guys. And it's good to know the industry for pornos in Japan is ginormous. The country is not that big. But the porn industry is giant. And in this industry, they have their own culture as well. Right now, the mob boss of Yamaguchi Gumi is this guy. Kenichi Shinoda. This guy believes that their group helps out the Japanese people the most. And he doesn't stop there. He calls himself the Robin Hood because I make money and give it to the poor. But we have to know this, that in the 2011 earthquake and tsunami that happened in Japan, a lot of people thank this group for the help that they received from them. So let's enter the group and see what they do. We don't exactly know what they do. If we could notice, the police will be on there. In Yakuza, just like the Italian Mafia or any cartel, you have to be very loyal to the family. So in this loyalty, a mistake is made and they're questioning your loyalty. In this case, they'll either kill you or if it's not that bad, they say for you to stay alive, you have to cut a part of your finger off and send it to the boss. In this case, you could continue what you're doing. Cutting your finger is something very Japanese and the samurais did it as well. Unlike the Italian mafias in New York, which have gotten a lot weaker, the Yakuza's are very powerful still, especially Yamaguchi Gumi. Their headquarters is located in Kobe, Japan. And in 2007, they killed the mayor of Kobe because he was trying to get involved with what they're doing. But they could never prove that they killed them. Just like we said, the Yakuza's are very proud of what they do and they claim to be a modern samurai. But the Japanese people, a lot of them hate that and they say these are criminal. A samurai is known as a hero, but the Yakuza's are putting a bad name on the samurai and it's disrespectful. We have to know that the Yakuza's have their own style of tattoos. Tattoos that are very obvious. 
The tattoos could be dragon, samurai, flowers and fire, or wolves and dogs. Anybody that has a wolf or dog tattoo, they're basically a bodyguard. Samurai means warrior, and the other ones they don't know much about. Now, these tattoos could be found everywhere, but this doesn't say for sure that they're part of a Yakuza. A lot of people have Illuminati tattoos, but they have nothing to do with the Illuminati. This is the same. Some people might get fake tattoos just to make themselves look cooler, but imitating their tattoos could be dangerous. If they notice you have their tattoos but aren't part of their group, there's a chance that you will get hurt. The worst one is killing you. If they don't want to kill you, they'll burn your skin and basically get rid of the tattoo. As you know, tattoos aren't removed very easily. It has to literally be burnt off. But this is not how to remove tattoos. They just do it in the most vicious way possible. It's the 1920s and a lot of criminals that used to live in Sicily and southern Italy have moved to New York City and are continuing their organized crime route and it's in this decade that their business is starting to boom. In the 1920s, there were five different crime families in New York City and every year they were getting stronger and bigger from kidnapping to murder, killing judges and officers, and bribing anything that they had access to, even high-end politicians. These five families basically created an illegal empire and they didn't listen to nobody. Nowadays, over a hundred years has passed and today's world is very different. We want to see what those powerful mafias are doing today. One of these mafia groups is called the Genovese crime family, also known as the Luciano family. Luciano was basically the name of the person that started this mafia group. At eight years old from Sicily, Italy, which wasn't a very safe organized place, his family decides to move to America. You could say Sicily's environment basically ruined this kid's mentality and his thought was always making money in an illegal way. He enters New York with this thought process and he successfully creates a mafia group which is also one of the most famous crime families. The Genovese crime family is still around, but what are they doing now? We have to say that it's a lot more strict than it used to be. They were very powerful until the year 2011, but around those years, in about one day, they arrested 127 members. The crimes they were accused of was murder, practice money laundering, extortion, illegal narcotics, and basically do whatever the hell you like. These accusations put in place by the police were all true. The most amount of money this family was making around 2011 was loan sharking. If you don't know what a loan shark is, it's basically a shark that gives out loan. But the shark is used for an evil person. Let's say for example, a person needs a thousand dollars cash right about now, no questions asked and they can't obtain it legally or from someone else. The loan shark will easily give them a loan, but the rules were, let's say I give you $1,000 cash right now, you have to pay me $1,500 next week. If the money was returned, no problem, but if it wasn't, they were either killed or they would get their money and some. Nowadays, if you mention mafia, the police come storming in, but still to this day, you would find them under the skin of the city of New York. Like for example, nobody truly knows who the boss of the Genovese crime family is. Some people believe that this man is the boss of the Genovese family named Liborio Bellomo. 
Even if he's not the boss of the family, he's considered somewhere in the higher up division. He was also arrested in 2008, but they couldn't figure out what he was doing legally. And at first they accused him of money laundering and they were forced to let him go because they couldn't find any proof. Of course, with the help of his lawyers, so is there only the Luciano family that's left in New York? No, the other four are still there. Like the number two spot, the Gambino crime family. They are still around. This family also originates from Sicily and the man that started it was named Carlo Gambino. This family in their prime were extremely powerful, but nowadays you don't hear much about them. And the people that were arrested on their behalf were very low tier members. Some say they might be extremely active in the city or not active at all. Either way, they're not truly sure what they're doing. But nowadays, it's not like back in the day where the organized crime they're committing is very obvious. And that's because nowadays, it's very easy to get arrested by doing those things. Do you know why it's so hard to commit organized crime nowadays? Because everywhere there are security cameras. Everybody has a smartphone with a high definition camera and hiding in plain sight is extremely difficult. Like 30 years ago, these mafia people would go into a train station, kill four people and take two people as hostages. But nowadays, this is not possible because from their car all the way to the train station, tens of cameras have recorded them. But allow us to talk about the most famous crime family in New York City, the Colombo crime family. The man that started this family was named Joseph Colombo. Just the way Joseph Colombo ordered the execution and killing of other members or other people, he was also killed the same way. He was shot in the head three times. The members of this family leak no information on what they're doing and the only information available to us is through the court documents and interrogations. And you could say the information we have doesn't even come close to what they're actually doing. And that's all because the members do not open their mouth because they know if they rat, they and their whole family is in danger. If you've seen our video about how to join the mafia, you know that the most important thing in joining a family, or should I say a crime family, is loyalty. And if a person doesn't show their true loyalty, they wouldn't even be considered to be a made man. The next crime family is called the Lucese crime family. The person that organized this family is called Tommy Lucese. And you could say he created the most merciless crime family in New York City. And some people considered them the deadliest mafia group in the US. Not only did this mafia group kill regular people, but they had so much tension with other crime families that they would start mafia wars. Some compare this crime family to Germany in World War I and World War II. They always had a vision of taking over the entire continent of Europe, but the whole world would fight against them. The Lucase crime family was the same. They were always trying to start wars to make their territory bigger. What we're telling you about this family is extremely simplified on what actually took place. One of the main things that a person needs to have to join a crime family in New York City is that you have to be 100% Italian. It was extremely rare that they would let a non-Italian, like for example an Irish, inside their mob. But just like the other ones, they had to show true loyalty before they were even considered. Until the 1970s, these families were painting the New York streets red. But just like we said, every day, their lives were becoming more difficult. The last activity that was seen by the Lucese family was in 2018. And the police realized that a doctor was prescribing oxycodone at an illegal rate to this family. And they would sell it in the streets. And in the United States, there are a lot of people addicted to this painkiller. In that year, the police successfully arrested the doctor and three members of the Lucese family. 
but a lot of people ask, how is it possible that only three people were arrested because of this? One word, loyalty. These three people might know everything and what is going on, but they will not open their mouth. Nowadays, some people predict that the Lucchese family has 200 made men and they make most of their money from underground casinos and the police are looking for these casinos hard. Everybody knows, even if a police is suspicious of something, they can't make their arrest until they have 100% proof. But allow us to get to know the fifth crime family in New York City. Bonanno crime family. And of course, they originated from Sicily as well. Joseph Bonanno is the founder of this family. It's good to know that he was alive until about 20 years ago. And that's in a way where he started in the 1920s. And he was active until the age of 97 years old. Another interesting fact is that Joseph Bonanno was active until 97 years old, but he was never truly arrested for any criminal acts. We don't know if he was extremely careful on what he did, or the people that were loyal to him were so careful for him. The Bonanno family is considered the richest crime family in New York as well. And the reason for the money is because they had a lot of pizza shops in New York City. But under the table, they were selling heroin alongside with the pizza. It was an interesting way in moving drugs. So anybody that wanted some heroin, they would order a pizza and say deliver it to my house. And whenever you get your pizza, you also had an extra package along with it. They basically killed two birds with one stone. With the help of the pizza shop, they could launder the drug money with the income they were making by the pizza. It's good to know that this family hasn't let this tradition go because in the year 2017, they busted an ice cream shop because they realized that the person behind it all was selling cocaine with the ice cream and the seller was part of this crime family. But nothing happened to the family because only one person was arrested. And that one person will not say a word about anything or what they do. Even if they say 100 years in prison, he's not gonna open his mouth. So anyways, these families are still around in New York City, but not as hard as they used to be. And they're losing their clout day by day. One of the biggest reasons that they can't commit organized crime is because of today's technology. 